Welcome to Book Hoops, Cambridge Libraries podcast. I'm Rosie and I'm a member of the library development team. In this episode, we're talking to Mandy Morton, creator of the number two feline detective agency series, featuring Hetty Bagshot and Tilly Jenkins. Join us for all things cat. Hi, Mandy. It's lovely to have a chance to talk to you. How are you today? Pretty good. Um, not too bad. I'm overlooking the sea in Cornwall currently. How lovely. <laughs> Lovely, you lucky woman. <laughs> yes, I am in grey Cambridgeshire. Damp. I think it's grey and damp everywhere. It's August, isn't it? So it's bound to be. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So anyway, we're really, really um, grateful that you've found time to take some time out of your Cornish day to talk to us. So what I really wanted to start um, by asking you is when did you start writing? It was shortly after I left the BBC. I'd had a, a 26 year career in broadcasting and um, I decided that it was time to stand down uh, from all of that and start pursuing some things that, you know, you, you have this wonderful stockpile of things that you mean to do for the rest of your life. Uh, and of course, retirement, like with most people, meant that my workload absolutely doubled out of and spiraled out of control. Um, but it was in the winter when usually I'm very, very busy doing art stuff and things like that. And I sat there one day and thought to myself, well, I, I need something to actually hook into that is going to to, you know, develop my mind even further. Uh, and it was interesting because uh, my partner Nicola and I um, had been adopting elderly cats um, and giving them sort of a really good end of life, two or three years, depending on, on how old they were. And my long lived cat, Hetty, uh, had uh, died under really sad circumstances. A vet had really screwed up badly with her and uh, she died. We then went on to adopt a little cat called Tilly, who was 13 years old when we adopted her. And we gave her an absolute riotous three years uh, until she had to leave us. And I was sitting there reflecting on all of this one day and thinking well, what would be great is if I could do something to raise some money for the cat charity that gave us those two beautiful cats. Um, and in doing that, I thought to myself, well, there's crime fiction all over this house because Nicola, of course, is a very well-known crime fiction writer with her Josephine Tay series. I absolutely love crime fiction right from the start. I'd done a lot of projects on it with the BBC. And so I thought, well, that's the obvious genre to go for. Um, but uh, working at the BBC, you do get a little bit sick of people uh, and them talking and, and you, you sort of end up interviewing a piece of paper in the end. You know, a PA comes in and says, puts this person in front of you and then you're supposed to come up with five or six questions to ask them. You probably know very little about them at all. Anyway, that side of my BBC work, I'd had it up to here. So I thought to myself, well, why people? I don't need people in this 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 book that I'm going to write. Um, I'm going to write about cats, and not only that, but the joyful thing was that I decided to bring Hetty and Tilly back to life again, and put them into um, a town which I devised, uh, which a very well sort of mirrored my bedsit days in Mill Road in Cambridge, where in Mill Road, if anybody knows that street, they will know that during the 70s, there was a shop for everybody. The whole street was absolutely full of everything. You never needed to leave Mill Road, basically. You could get everything you wanted uh, in life in Mill Road. And so I, I, in my mind's eye, I thought, well, that's good. And then I thought about the bedsitter days and I thought, well, Hetty and Tilly, they wouldn't be able to afford a a house or a flat of their own, they're going to have to have a bolt hole. And of course, bearing in mind the fact that I was wanting to raise money for homeless cats, uh, I just came up with a scenario over the fact that Hetty and Tilly were sort of on their beam ends and two beautiful white cats from Lancashire, Betty and Beryl Butter, who ran the bakery in this town, invited them to share their back room, their storeroom, essentially. And from that moment on, Hetty and Tilly set up a little bed sitter, which also became the number two feline detective agency, because Hetty couldn't think of any way of earning money. And the two of them decided together that because Tilly was absolutely sewn on crime fiction she devours crime fiction um Hetty thought to herself well it can't be that difficult to start sorting out 
crimes. So we'll become detectives. And that's where the whole thing started. So the very first book, the number two feline detective agency spun from there. And it was wonderful. It was just like having a doll's house full of characters that I moved around and changed around. And of course, doll's house is another big thing with me. So it was an absolute joy to spend that winter writing this first book and putting it out there to raise money. But then a London publisher picked it up and the blue touch paper was lit because I suddenly realized that I'd then got to do another one and another one and another one. And I've just delivered book 10. <laughs> so, so that's how it all began. Yeah, and do you, do you, have you written more of your cats in or is it only just Hetty and Tilly? Sadly, we lost Molly Bloom not so long ago. Molly uh, came after Tilly. Uh, so Molly Bloom now has a cafe in the town called Bloomers um, in uh, the latest books. So she, she's there. Uh, some friends of ours who we used to look after their cats when they went away had Popper, who in my town is a plumber. So Popper's in there. Uh, Bruiser was our outdoor cat for many, many years. He sort of came and went as he pleased uh, and there was always a plate of food waiting for him. Um, sadly, we lost him. So Bruiser's in there and Bruiser is, is the, the muscle behind the number two feline detective agency. And he drives the motorbike and sidecar, Miss Scarlet, uh, for Hetty and Tilly when they're off on their adventures. So <laughs> yeah, they're, they're creeping in. I mean, several of my readers uh, have got in touch and said, oh, so-and-so died. We had to say goodbye to our lovely cat. Um, in the very latest book that I've just delivered, uh, there is a, a main character in there that's taken from one of my reader's cats that they lost. So uh, unfortunately, it continues. It is a, it's a sort of a living wall. It's like a memorial, isn't it? It absolutely is. It absolutely is. And, and taking their particular traits, which makes the characterization lovely. Have you thought about it? Some authors will run a sort of um, a, a fundraiser uh, for charity where you can pay to have your, your name, you can be a character in their book. Have you thought about doing that to raise more funds for cats? Um, I, could, I possibly could do that, but then I'd be inundated with, with lots and lots of characters. And the, the thing about these books is that having created a town, there are returnee characters all the time. People like Lavender Stamp, who runs the post office in the town, who's a harridan. Uh, she loves keeping people waiting and queuing. Um, and there's post office regulations come into absolutely everything. She, she is a, a bit of a witch, really. Um, and so I have to have room in the books to bring in the regular characters like Betty and Beryl Butter, the people that run the bakery. And you notice I use the word people because in my mind, they are. They might have tails and whiskers, but to me, I move them around the books uh, doing everyday things that you and I would do because that's important to me. And it's set in the 70s, which is also important to me because I don't have to deal with technology that we all have to deal with on, on every day, but they don't even have a mobile phone. You know, I mean, they, they, they've only just discovered the video recorder. So it's such fun to do that. I do like the fact they keep their telephone on a cushion in the sideboard. Well, that's because Hetty can't bear the outside world encroaching on her psyche, which is very interesting because I'm afraid that's a bit like me. Once my front door is shut, that's it. I'm not interested. You know, the end of the day is the end of the day. And Hetty feels that about it, which is why Tilly is just so mild mannered and will deal with all these things to help Hetty to get through life, basically. Mm. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I, I was going to say why cats, but you just explained that beautifully. And then the, I do love their domestic setup. And I just find, and, and this is this is not good for me. When I read your work, I'm just constantly reading about food, Mandy. You are constantly eating. And I'm just, you know, I could add half a stone every time I sit down to read one of your books and it's pastries and it's pies and it's ice cream. And it's it's just... It's a whole world wrapped in, in beautiful food, isn't it? Where, where's that come from? Well, food is, is a huge character in the book. Um, and I think that the thing that always got to me in the past about reading people's books is that whenever anybody is talking about people sitting down to a meal, they never truly discuss what's going on on the plate. And I always think that's that's a bit sad. You know, they say they've sat, they've sat down to a meal and then they got up and went and watched television. What was that meal? What were they eating? And putting Hetty and Tilly behind a bakery 
Um, in my early days at, at uh, the radio station, um, we used to have bakers. Obviously, they get up in the middle of the night. They get up at four o'clock and they start baking. And it was, in fact, the Mill Road bakers that used to deliver to the radio station when I was doing the breakfast show the most wonderful things. And they were still warm and they were still hot. And I, I just got that feeling from the fact of what it must be like to hear these baking ovens roar at four o'clock in the morning and, and then there's Hetty and Tilly trying to get a little bit more sleep and then this beautiful smell that comes out with the breads and the pies and the pastries and the, I see I'm off again and of course cats cats are actually and can be either very difficult about food or very greedy about food and Hetty and Tilly do not exist for more than an hour and a half without having a top up even if it, it's it's something like a biscuit in a pocket which has been there for a fortnight Tilly will find it and of course I think that Hetty's sugar levels are quite low so she needs to top them up all the time so it's and it's a wonderful chapter break to be able to have a meal or take them out for a meal and of course they don't go anywhere on a detective job without there being food supplied on the job which reminds me of my band days when of course you always insisted that there need to be food in the dressing room it's that thing we're not going to work unless we're looked after and fed so all the cakes the pastries all their favorite things and they love shopping as well and of course i've got malkin and sprinkle the supermarket in the town or m&s of course um, and there you you know you get to go into the food hall and you see all the food in there as well so it, it it's it's a no-brainer it, it's got to be lots and lots of food yeah and as a vegetarian my mouth waters <laughs> really does I mean I was just reading and Tilly was was in the delicatessen she was getting slices of turkey I thought I don't eat turkey but it's lovely but, yeah I'm thinking what time's lunch <laughs> when can I have lunch now and I'm now rumbling but it's it's just it's such a huge huge part of the stories and and it's just everywhere they go they are offered food they are given food they find food and do you know it's a really really pernickety point but do they use cutlery not really um, Tilly has a precise way of eating things. She di dissects her food. Uh, one of her favourite things is a cream horn. And of course, she doesn't just bite it. She gets the cream out first and then, then takes it right down to the corner. It, it's like one of those things when you're a kid, you tend to dissect. When I was a child, I used to take all the breadcrumbs off the fish fingers and eat that first. And then I'd be left with this lovely white piece of fish. And that would be the final bit. I still do it to this day. And the dissecting of food is all part of the celebration of it, rather than just forking it in, which, which of course, is, is perhaps what a dog would do. Mm. Uh, you know, a dog closes its eyes and opens its mouth. Uh, whereas a cat will delicately sort it out and put the biscuits to one side and do the. And I love that. I, I like making food an adventure. And, and obviously it's something that they embrace big time. Yeah, and obviously her wardrobe does suffer quite a bit because we're always reading about her cardigan and her buttons being smeared and she needs an extra serviette absolutely <laughs> and also I mean Hetty's aware of it so whenever they go out in posh company like if they go to see Fluff with a fork at with a fork hall which is the the uh, stately home that I've, I've given the town um, when they go there of course she has to be on her best behavior and she has to sit very quietly and and not cause any any problems with the eating of the food and she even chooses things that are easier to eat when she's in company yeah well I've just finished reading pocket full of pie and and I, I had to smile because at one point she's got butter over her blanket her pajamas and all of her clothes have been bespattered so she ends up having um getting the tin bath out and having a bath in with the clothing so she just she just waves her legs around and becomes a washing machine. Absolutely. Well, I mean, this is it, isn't it? It's the changing of the times. Although I do think that in the new book, they do actually borrow the Butters Twin Tub, which is a new arrival. Mm. Yeah, they were tricky beasts. My mother had twin tubs. They always flooded the, the, uh, the floor. And I used to love little rubber mat you used to put on the spin dryer. <laughs> stop it all coming out the top and going all over the ceiling and you had to hose it down it was it was a work of art a twin tub so I shall look forward to reading about that yes well needless to say there has been an incident with it it's gonna happen is food involved <laughs> um it was beforehand yes obviously hmm. you could put money on that really couldn't you <laughs> so I mean speaking of pocket full of pie I mean obviously not giving anything away but it is set in and around a radio station 
Now, who would have thought you would have written about that, Mandy? Well, I'll tell you something. From starting the series, um, every time I've come round to thinking about where I want to set the next book, the radio station has always been top of the list. But for some unknown reason, I have swerved away from it and taken on other subject matter instead. So this time round, I felt that it was time to do it. Not only that, but I think that I came away from that long term job uh, feeling quite traumatic about it. And it took time to digest and put things into context as when you've had a very long career in something and then a regime change uh, makes you feel bad about that job, uh, which is what happened to me and, and many other people. Uh, at that particular radio station, uh, you you don't want it to be a vengeance thing that you're writing down. You want to be able to celebrate that time. And so it was exactly the right moment to celebrate radio. And not only that, but I think to give an insight into the background of the pressures that are on radio presenters. There's always someone on your shoulder waiting to take your job. It's a very ambitious thing and you have to keep up to date with the technology. You really do have to move forward because there is always somebody behind to take that show off you or to take that production off you and what have you. And, you know, you have to weather the storm. And, and so that is one of the central things within this particular book, Pocket Full of Pie. I mean, you know, it's funny, it's a comedy, but at the same time, it's very important to me when I'm writing these things that there's a lot of serious subject matter as well. And so the ambitiousness of a radio station uh, certainly figures greatly in it. But uh, having said that, I mean, we've got a Bake Off competition and, and, and an ongoing cricket match, which ain't going nowhere. So it's lovely to incorporate the whole thing together. Yeah, um, you do get all of those strands. I mean, there is tragedy in the radio station, really. There is personal tragedy, isn't there? Yes. And then, But then you've got the counter counterbalanced by Fanny Haddock, the celebrity cook. She is Fanny Haddock, isn't she? Yes, yeah, she is. Yes, yeah, she, she is. is. And I do remember Johnny and Fanny on TV. And they were extraordinary. And the thing that got to me was, I mean, as, as a child, I think I remember her as being the first on TV cook. Um, and she was of her time. Um, the things that, that the, the way that she used to sort of make a trifle, everything looked so disgusting in those days. There was there was no feeling of anything looking beautiful. You know, she stuffed a turkey, the whole hand went inside and it, and it was just revolting. And in fact, a couple of Christmases ago, uh, Nicola and I were watching a bit of daytime telly while we were doing some Christmas wrapping. And there she appeared. They were rerunning Fanny Craddock's Christmas and she was getting all the Christmas stuff ready. She was doing the hams, the turkeys, the truffles. And it, the whole thing was disgusting, the way she was handling this food uh, with, the, with the red nail varnish going into the turkeys and stuff. And it, it actually came over as being really quite grotesque compared with, in, as a child, thinking, oh, that lady's cooking something lovely and nice, you know, for tea. And so I wanted to create a character that, that respected Fanny Haddock, but also was a nod to how strange it all was. And, and bearing in mind the fact that we are wall to wall with cooking competitions on TV, um, I want to do something a little bit different where, where the celebrity cook wasn't quite what we'd hoped she would be. Um, and a bit of a letdown, basically. And of course, it, it, it has to end in carnage. Anything to do with food in these books ends in carnage, and of course it does. Uh, but she was a great character to use. Mm. Well, I, I must admit, I, I I remember it all being in black and white. Yes. And I remember being quite terrified. Well, she 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 didn't take prisoners, that's for sure. <laughs> Poor Johnny. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. It, it, yeah, it's a different world, though, as you see. Yeah. And also, there is the humiliation of, of creating something uh, and then having to publicly show it. I mean, there is a, there is a, a, a wonderful moment of humiliation in a pocket full of pie when they're doing the heats to, to try and get the contestants together uh, and somebody decides to turn up with something shop bought and of course there is a there is a huge explosion over that um, and so you know cheats are found out uh, and humiliated in various ways uh, my, my readers will cheer when they find out who that particular character is but there you go uh, somebody gets their comeuppance. Well, one thing I must admit, when I was finishing off um, Pocket Full of Pie, you, you, you're in your world, people get their just desserts, and no pun intended. 
they do get their just desserts and you know justice is seen to be delivered which i think is very comforting it's also um part of the the golden age rule of crime mm -hmm. fiction that the fact that there should be a solution and it should be satisfying and equally that there should also be enough clues in it so that you can actually solve it within the first 50 pages if you if that's what you're reading for and mm -hmm. for me the actual crime itself um is 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 set apart from all the characterization it has to be a good crime it has to have a, a really good solution to it and those that are uh, victims um need need to have a resolution and certainly the perpetrators need to be punished in some way and for me it's very difficult in these books to actually arrive at that in the end because I don't have police I don't have police cats in it it is just Hetty and Tilly is the justice in these books therefore they don't have to work with a local constabulary I didn't want to have a load of thick cat policemen bumbling around messing up the crime I wanted it to be very much about Hetty and Tilly so they're not going to go around hanging people or electrocuting people at the end of a book. So the, the resolution of what happens to, if you like, the nasty cats in the book has to be has to be something very important to me. And I think in Pocket Full of Pie, it's absolutely right. I was cheering for the scouts. <laughs> yes, yes. Just leave that there. I was cheering for the scouts. And then I thought, oh, was that was that bad of me? No, not at all. Not at all. I, was, I mean, I've. I've got your list of your works here and I mean it's a growing list Mandy it is a growing list do you have a particular favorite out of all the ones you've written so far it's very uh, hard I mean I could easily say the one that I've just delivered to my publishers um which is called the cat and the pendulum Ooh. and uh it is it is set uh in in uh, Dickensian London um and is a nod to the crimes of Jack the Ripper now, the, putting all that little lot together uh, essentially actually feeds into a lot of project work that I did at the BBC, because um, time and time again, at least twice a year, um, I would get a press release from a publishing house to say that this particular author has solved the crimes of Jack the Ripper. And it used to be a continuous procession of people coming into my studio and justifying uh, why the person that they decided did those murders back in 1888 did them. And um, the Ripperologists, which, which essentially these people actually go under that, that banner, um, were really interesting people because they, they usually had relics in their homes of all sorts of strange things like hanging nooses and things like that. Um, I visited a few of them in situ um, and, and it created a, a very sort of seedy world. And I wanted to revisit that um, in respect of the fact that everybody seems to forget that those five women were murdered horribly back in 1888. Um, the, the excitement of the fact of this cloaked hero marching up and down the East End, you know, with a sharp knife, killing these people and mutilating them. Um, it seems to have passed everybody by that these women were women proper human beings. Um, and it is something that I think is, is a, a very important subject matter these days, particularly with us continuing to have the most horrendous murders and abuse, uh, abusings of, of women. Uh, so for me, there is a very, very important message in the brand new book. Equally, of course, there's plenty of food, there's plenty of fun. Um, and Hetty and Tilly, of course, approach the ongoing crime, which actually is a missing manuscript which has just been completed by Agatha Crispy, who summons Hetty and Tilly to London uh, to find the manuscript. And as soon as they get to London, they get embroiled in all manner of, of other things as well. So it's like putting Hetty and Tilly in the East End of London in a very Dickensian area and watching how they react. And, and I'm very pleased with that book. Uh, but then if you'd have asked me a year ago, I'd have said it would be pocket full of pie. But there is a huge heartwarming feeling for, for the ghost of Christmas pause uh, which uh, was sort of like four or five books down the line and that brings me to my second home in Cornwall where we spend an awful lot of time and write I'm write an awful lot of the books here and um, that actually looks at the community here and obviously putting whiskers and tails on them all 
Um, but that was a wonderful book to write. And where I'm sitting now, um, the whole book was set on, on just one road that goes down to the sea. And, and that was wonderful. And they visit Jamaica Inn or Jam Makers Inn on their way to Cornwall, uh, which everybody knows as the stop off point. So um, it, lots of characters along the way. It's, it's another one of their road trips, basically. Marvellous. Yeah, it, it's um, that'll be an intriguing one to read when it comes out. When is it coming out, Mandy? Next May. Right on. OK. <laughs> Got a while to wait then. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think our time is very, very nearly up. So um, just really want to point out to our listeners that all of your books are available from Cambridge Libraries. We have them in physical format and we have them as e-books. We have them as e-audio books. Mm-hmm. So you can choose your platform. Um, so the, uh, the e-books and the e-audio are on our Libby platform. And if anybody is interested, if we've, if we've whetted their appetite, just go on to our catalogue, see what we've got. And um, do you, would you recommend starting it? Number one, the number two feline detective agency, or do you think you could read in any order, Mandy? I write them as standalones. It's important to do that so that people can catch up uh, or they can just take the first one and, and go through the whole gambit. But uh, Pocket Full of Pie is, is book... Uh, it's nine on mine. Ten. Or book is it ten? ten? Is it book ten? No, it's book ten, yes. Oh, no, it is. It's book nine. It is book nine. I've just my librarian research. You're right. I've just delivered book 10 and book 11 has just been ordered. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Lovely. Well, we will let you crack on with that one. So basically, thank you so much for taking time to, to have a chat today. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful summer. And, you know, we may be getting back towards actually meeting in libraries. Who knows? It would be absolutely wonderful. It's been my pleasure, uh, as always. And uh, lots of love to the readers. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. You can find our other episodes on Anchor FM, Spotify and lots of other podcast platforms. Book Hoots is produced by Cambridgeshire Libraries.